It's four o'clock, everybody. Let's get going. Welcome back to Burrows and Burbs, the podcast that takes you on a tour of the world's most luxurious real estate markets. On today's episode, we're diving into the European luxury market, and we're thrilled to have Oyvind Olstad, a real estate expert that I met in Barcelona, or was it Palm Springs, or maybe it was Chicago. But anyway, uh, he's always all over the world. Very excited to have him here. Um, and he's a lover of all things opulent. And he's going to be joining us. I think he was thinking that he might go to Spain to do this episode. But instead, he's in Norway. He's in downtown Oslo. And that's where we're going to do the show. And he's going to walk into the restaurant and then he's going to show us from the perspective of the restaurant, but he's going to start out there on the streets of Oslo. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why listen to a show about luxury European real estate? Well, let's be real. Who doesn't love living vicariously through the lifestyles of the rich and famous from the great estates in the English countryside, which I'm going to ask you about, penthouses overlooking the Mediterranean, there's something magical about Europe that draws us all in. That's why we're here. So grab your caviar and your champagne. Join us as we peel back the curtain on this fascinating market. And with that, Oyvind, take it away. Where are you now? Broadcasting directly from the port of Oslo, overlooking the Bay of Oslo here. And we have, um, it was really a beautiful introduction, uh, John, you had there. Thank you very much for that. Uh, but it's at the bay here. You, you see behind me, you, you heard about the painter. Edvard Monk. Monk. Yes, exactly. the scream. The scream, yeah. So this is the new uh, Monk Museum in the, in the Bay of Oslo. And you have the Oprah House. It's, they took down the lights a little, little bit because I was thinking that we should start uh, having uh, this uh, podcast in the, in the roof um, top uh, bar there. But they're closing at um, 10 o'clock, so we... So we are, we are, we need to be here in, uh, in this beautiful restaurant instead in Iki in, uh, in the port of Oslo. You see, this is uh, one of the new um, residential uh, beautiful places in Oslo. Uh, they build new uh, apartments in the port here and uh, constructed a, a new skyline uh, called Barcode behind. It this all is looks finan- very new and very shiny. Life must exactly. be good in Norway right now. Very rich economy, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's good. This uh, we are um, we uh, we were lucky. I think um, like 40, 50 years ago when we found the uh, petroleum in the sea, and uh, we, the Norwegian was uh, fishermen and um, and farmers mostly. And then it came somebody to Norway and helped us with uh, starting the business. And then um, so the life is good there, but the people are uh, still uh, really good workmen and. Um, so we are, little, we are, uh, yeah, so that's good. I want to bring you in here to the restaurant so I can okay. sit uh, properly in my, uh, it, can, it might be some noise here because, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, 10 o'clock in the evening and uh, people are out eating dinner and sitting in the bars. So, but, uh, so I found, my, found me, myself a nice place here. No, you, you sound just fine. And I think it's very yep. exciting to be downtown where all the action is. So um, you're in downtown at your friend's restaurant and we've seen uh, exactly. the harbor. Now, you sell the harbor or do you mostly sell the big estates outside of town? We are selling, uh, we are selling both because uh, these apartments in the harbor here um, uh, have been developed now since... Uh, it's two different harbors there. It's another one on the other side, other bay. This started in in the eighties, and then this is still the most expensive uh, apartments in the harbor. But the, this is another um, part of Oslo. That actually, this was this was where Oslo started. Uh, Oslo, one hundred years ago, was only thirty thousand people. Now it's like six hundred thousand people in Oslo. And now uh, the first apartments and the first buildings in Oslo was just here like 100 years ago. Um, uh, and now they've constructed these uh, beautiful uh, properties here down um, on this side with, with the new, uh, it's close to the central station. 
and that's important you know to if you want to go to to the airport like 10 20 minutes so we are selling to be short short uh, on your question we are selling here and we are selling countryside and means countryside then we you know during pandemic uh, the countryside properties increased a lot because uh, people you know like rest of the world is the same uh, they are uh, they went up a lot and the people are uh, want to go out on the countryside and um, and uh, with the family and they can work remotely that happened during the pandemic here as the rest of the world all right i'm going to show my screen and we're going to talk about where in the world you are right now so i've got on my screen right now a map of norway and you're in oslo which is uh, uh got a port uh in the south and you said you were 10 minutes from the airport. So I presume that if I'm uh, working in London, is it a cheap and quick flight over to Oslo and then a quick uh, and cheap flight over to maybe Lillehammer for skiing or into the uh, the Northern Islands? How, how far is it and how inexpensive, how easy is it to get to other places? From uh, from London to Oslo, it's like two hours plane, and you can get uh, really good prices from uh, with the plane. From uh, from London to Oslo, you it's between like fifty dollars to uh, one hundred fifty dollars. You fly uh, between there, and uh, the same if you want to go to New York, it's not it's like one uh, it's like five hundred dollars, maybe less to come here and um, to the airport is uh, 20 minutes with train and um, and uh, to get to the north of Norway uh, where we have a really beautiful um, beautiful landscape and uh, maybe that maybe what Norway is mostly famous about is the is the fjords and the uh, and the north um, the nature in the north you know the Lofoten uh, in the north where I'm selling a Selling some really beautiful plots as well for um, for construction. All right. So since you brought it up, let's talk about uh, what do you call it? Um, let me see if I can find it again. Okay. So yeah. I have to zoom Lofoten. in, and we'll zoom in again. Keep where going. is where's Oslo? Oh, yeah. Did I lose Oslo? Yeah, you got to go. Uh, yeah. Now we are uh, around the uh, UK. Yeah. There we are, Norway. There we are. Yeah, yeah. you okay. know the map. And John. you're going, yeah. and you're selling yeah. islands up here. We are selling um, uh, the north of Norway with the, for instance, Lofoten, this area. Where is that in relation to, uh, where is Norfolk? I can't find it on this map. You see Bode, Bode, a little bit up. Still further north. Yeah. Still further north. Should be. S still more. Yeah. Are we on the right? Uh... No, I think I've gone too far. All right. Yeah. But, but at any rate, Lofoten looks like Lofoten. this. Exactly. Okay. So up there, you you will have in, during the summer you have a light uh, twenty four uh, seven. And so, uh, then you have uh, the midnight sun, we call it, you know, and uh, and in the winter you have the northern lights. It's like you see on the pic pictures there. So I think in the future we will have more. Uh, Already now, it's a lot of people coming from uh, all over the world to explore uh, this area, uh, especially from China. And you have a lot, of course, from the US as well, because we have a lot of uh, Norwegian people who, who uh, like the rest of the world, people came to US um, in the year 1800, wasn't it? And uh, where um, everybody, and, and it was maybe the, maybe the first one coming there uh, in, after the Indians was a Norwegian, Leif Eriksson. Right, he we've heard over. of him. We we got, yeah, yeah. We, got <laughs> I, I, we we heard about him in the history books. All right, exactly. so let's yeah. let's recap. You're in Oslo, and you're selling uh, both the city of six hundred thousand people, 
the ski resorts and uh, the islands in the north of Norway. But you also just came from Spain, where you are part of a whole European network of luxury real estate sellers. And you are, and, and that's how things get done. It's a little loud there. Um, and that's how things get done in Europe, which is fascinating to us because in America, we rely a good deal on the MLS, you know, and websites and data. But what you've told me is that it's really uh, much more reliant on a personal network over there in Europe. Is that the case? I, I thought actually this was the same uh, in US as well, but um, because you need to know the right people to find the right properties. And uh, you know, what, what I maybe told you was that uh, very often people don't want to, to list the property because they don't want to show, show that they are um, selling the property. Right. Uh, because they don't want to tell everybody that they're selling it. Right. Then that's why they uh, they want to list and they want to have it through an um, agent that know a lot of people and having a like a round table sitting and they send it between them because we maybe much know who who is the buyer. Uh, another thing is that if you um, uh, some people don't want to buy something that's listed as well because and that, that's maybe more uh, normal in the commercial uh, real estate where you have um, is hardly never listed when you are in the commercial real estate because then you you know the investors so uh, and then the same same with the development prop, uh, plots on land then you 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 sell it directly to the developer so um that's what we do as well so in spain for instance we and you know in uh, through, through spain you you uh, people are coming from uh, all over europe and maybe maybe from uh, middle east as well and then it's not uh they don't you, if you put it online all, all the time people think it's not sold and they want to take the price down so then you need to have it a little bit off market because you, ha you need to take it off market sometimes because then the, the client is asking, where is the property? And then they're coming back. You know? So Same thing is happening here. Uh, but, uh, I do but I do think that the European way is a bit different. I do think that the Americans do rely a good deal more on Zillow.com, Realtor.com, and a broad... Uh, you know, United States uh, data platform online. Um, they tell us that most people do their search online and then they contact a realtor in the luxury market, but they don't want to appear uh, to be ignorant of the market, you know, when, when they arrive. So they do a great deal of research online first, or they try. Exactly. It's a little bit loud where you are. It got a lot louder. They must be they must be having a good time in Oslo. So is some somebody speaking here, maybe talking in uh with it's okay now or no, it's a little loud. So I want to go with somebody else. You, yeah. It's okay. You maybe you want to walk around while we talk. I don't know. Anyway, do that you, well. yeah. Yeah. Scott, do you want to ask a question or I mean I'll dive into who who's buying next? I'm curious about the, the size of the of the marketplace. I mean, so what what's a average size sale in Oslo? And I mean, what's the high end of the market? You know, what sort of price range is the high end of the market? And are there like 50 high end or 5,000 high end departments in Oslo? So the so the um, this changed a lot during the last years because uh uh, because, like, let's uh, say uh, the last uh, ten years, um, uh, maybe like the uh, rest of the world as well, um, the Norwegians got uh, got uh, more wealthy. So, um, so what we saw the last uh, te about ten years is that uh, a normal, uh, the, maybe the most expensive property in Oslo. 10 years ago was like uh, 2 million dollars. Uh, now it's like we have some some, some of these penthouses in the port close to where I'm now. It's, they say like uh, 35 million, you know? 32 so, uh, million to 35 million? 
Wow. Wow. Yeah. But not, but uh, it was uh, maybe this apartment wasn't for sale. You know, it was just constructed ten years ago, but it wasn't for sale. So now, now it was. Uh, if it comes for sale now, it's a it's a few uh, properties that uh, goes for like ten million uh, and up. This this is uh, quite normal here now. Who buys ten million dollar apartments in Norway? People who want to live there, of course, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's billionaires. Uh, we call it, you know, uh, to be a billionaire in uh, in Norwegian crowns, it's like uh, one tenth of a billionaire in uh, in US dollars. So, but it's uh, it's everyone from like lawyers to lawyers to investors to doctors to. Excuse yeah, me. But, 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 are, yeah. Excuse me. Are these Eastern Bloc and Soviet people buying in Oslo? Like, no. No, it's not the not. same profile as London. No, it's not. It's uh, it's the same as uh. No, it's not. It's not coming. Are these from, Norwegians uh, Russia. or are they foreigners who are buying? Mostly, uh, mostly Norwegian, but uh, there are, of course, uh, people coming. I heard uh, yesterday that uh, in the mountains, uh, that we're talking about uh, the most expensive uh, chalets in the in the most um, prestigious um, uh, slopes, you know, in in, in the winter um, winter resorts. Uh, there are coming people now from U.S. from uh, from uh, Germany from uh, from uh, UK to buy the because they are um, it's difficult with the snow conditions in the in the middle of Europe so this is one that there. you're selling uh, is this on yeah. the island or is this in the Alps this is uh, in uh, this is like two and a half hour from Oslo drive with car uh, this is for uh, this is 3.7 million dollars okay is it near Lillehammer, Lillehammer if, Ski? If you go there a little bit up now and on the picture, you can see more pictures of the property. If you see, if you scroll it on to the right there, you see? You have a, you have a, um, you have a, you can scroll on the on the picture. You have more pictures. Yeah. It's close to, it's, it's uh, where uh, Tommy Mo uh, won the um, Olympic uh, gold medal in uh, 1994 in Lillehammer. It's beautiful. Yeah. So this is uh, what this is what luxury looks like in Scandinavia. Exactly. Yeah. It's a lot beautiful. of wood. How how hard is it to yeah. build? It, I mean, I, I look at, at Norway, and you have a very big country that's very spread out, without a whole lot of population in different areas. So how hard is it to build a house like this? And does it take a year or two years, or do you have any idea? Less than a year. Uh, you and in this this area is uh, really good regulations because uh, the uh, the municipality ha has had made uh, regulations ready, so you can just if the plot is ready to build, so you uh, in this plot you can build uh, like uh, three thousand uh, square feet. Uh, feet. Uh, three four four thousand square feet on this okay. plot and uh it, it takes less than a year because uh i think uh, i have um, i had my own um chalet uh like uh, that i constructed um 14 years ago i bought the i bought the plot in june and it was ready in christmas and then it was timber from uh from um timber from uh actually Lat latvia Latvia, yeah. yeah. Lithuania, no, not Latvia. Was. So it's, uh, they are ready, the teams that are building this kind of uh, chalets, they are, they are ready to build it. And uh, they, um, so, yeah. so if the buyer coming to build, uh, build this, and this is um, quite quick, yes. And are most of the if, houses, are, th are they built on a speculative basis? So does somebody buy the land and put up a house and then sell it? Or do people build them custom for themselves? For themselves. And normally they do it for themselves, but somebody do it. Uh, maybe they think that this is a good investment, so in uh, they will uh, 
if they do if they put this amount of money in into the um, into the plot they will they think that they will get it back but then you should sell it during uh, like uh, two to five years because it's always changing the style and uh, before it's coming wow. more loud, loud music here too <laughs> that yeah. is an incredibly beautiful house I can't yeah. believe it's only three point seven million dollars, and I really can't believe that you can build it in less than a year. Scott, how long would it take you to build that, and what would you charge? Well, it, the the permitting would take a year. Right, I mean, right. It, that, that's that's where you start, and that's if you're as of right. Um, no, so it, it, the for building a three thousand square foot house, that's not that a year is something that's definitely very doable. But the permitting is is a huge problem and very difficult take a lot longer so you, so you should come over here then let me cooperate you know <laughs> well I, i've even had a friend that uh that got called up to build something in connecticut and he's from florida and after he after about a year you know he called me up and said how do you guys build anything i mean just the regulations are beyond comprehension to somebody that doesn't have to deal with them this is my friend Lars is coming with a uh... If this was alcohol, was it okay? No. <laughs> so what are you drinking? It's a drink, but I don't know if uh, what it is inside, but uh, is that a load, uh, John? It's, a, it's, after four, it's after five, you're welcome to drink anything. After five? Ah, oh, it's coming another one here. They're spoiling me with the nice uh, drinks there now. Yeah. All right, Thank we got to get back to serious stuff here. Yeah. yeah. The economy. On the one hand, it's been tremendously good in, in Norway because of the energy prices have been rising. And the sovereign fund in Norway is, uh, has got a lot of money. On the other hand, there, we've heard a lot of talk about a recession in Europe because of those energy prices and because of the uncertainty. So are you finding that uncertainty is having an impact on your business or are you far enough away from the conflict that you're not ha seeing a direct effect? I mean, we, um, of course, it's obvious that uh, it's an effect of the... Uh... Of the war and the uh, energy prices and uh, the um, everything in the material material uh, prices, uh, but we uh, everybody think that um, this is just uh, not a recession. You think this like it's like a little bit pending market. We're waiting for for what's going to happen. Uh, I think this is uh, maybe the, the same all over uh, Europe and maybe in the US as well, but. Um, you, you have to do, uh, if I start with Norway then, um, you told me, you just told that the Norway is actually earning a lot of money on the, on the war. That's not, uh, that's not a good thing, but, but we are helping out uh, Ukraine too, like you know, a lot of the rest of the world. So, so the Norwegian's uh, wealth fund they increased by... Uh, it's like for uh, 40 percent during the last year because of the energy prices but the the normal person in the street like uh, living in their house of course they are feeling the energy prices uh but we are getting a lot of help from the government to pay the uh, the bills so i don't think really it will be i think it's good for people as well to suffer a little bit because then they remember well um, to be more um happy for what they have so uh, and when you when we're thinking about for instance, I had um, had a talk before um, before this. Uh, I, I did some really really good research with my friends in London, and uh, um, our friends. I, I have to mention them. You know, it's uh, Stratton Parker with um, Ed Thompson. Uh, I talked with him, um, and he said that uh, the the the. the it's the same as in Norway, and the normal people are suffering a little bit. But the, the market is uh, in London went up uh, quite much because, uh, and some parts of London, it's uh, like from 50 to 75% of the 
the area is uh, is buyers from uh, from international buyers. So um, and the the uh, the uh, uh, rental prices went up fifty percent since twenty twenty one. So the luxury market is not suffering uh, in London. The same in um, in Marbella uh, in uh, in south of Spain. I, I believe it's the same um, effect. Uh, you know, in in Spain, you have the, the luxury markets is mainly in uh, Marbella region in Andalusia. Uh, you have uh, Mallorca and you have Ibiza, and I, I believe it's the same there. And the agents down there have been petty buyers. Then in Marbella estates. You tell me that uh, the um, the prices in uh, Marbella uh, for um, increased with twenty two percent, and the uh, the rental prices increased with thirty percent, and there is the uh, there is coming people from Ukraine and, uh, and and Russia to buy and from Poland, uh, so they're getting uh, effects from the different effects from the war um, around Europe. Is that the answer on the questions? Yeah, that's a good answer. I, I mean, yeah. we we get stories over here about um, them turning off the gas, right? And we think, oh, there must be a crisis going on in Europe where they're they're turning off the heat in the winter, and um, and 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 transportation costs, you know, are, are are out of this world, and and things are starting to break down. But it sounds like you're talking about two distinctly different markets. That while the the people um, the the luxury market is actually quite insulated from the war. Is that true? Uh, yeah, seems like it's uh, really true because uh, and it's a little bit sad that it's um, it's the normal people that's suffering, of course. Uh, but since we are, uh, but I think that will go run over more quickly than especially for Norway I don't think we will have a real recession now and uh, um, both um, my uh, our partners in uh, London and in Marbella as well they they say that it's quite positive um, signals from the market that uh, we will not really have a recession I don't know how it how it's uh, in the US you think it's a recession or uh, is it um is it just uh, something that goes over? My my answer is this: that while, while we're we are talking a good deal about Fed tightening and monetary policy and inflation are having uh, an effect on the economy, I will say that the luxury market, when we talk to the folks in Palm Beach and in Los Angeles, none of them are talking about deflation. Of real estate, none of them are talking about prices going down in all in any of the key luxury markets. Um, and there, and, and when we ask them why, they say that we have been underbuilding for a decade. And Scott can talk to that, but we've been building too few homes for more than a decade, and that the there is more demand than supply. And even these Fed tightening and monetary policy uh, can't can't ignore that fact, exactly. right, Scott? It, it, it's definitely the high end is 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 you know knock on wood here, but the high end should do continue to do reasonably well for the foreseeable future. And there's definitely a housing shortage and a shortage of affordable housing across virtually all of the United States in at least desirable or, or average type communities. So it's, it, there is a shortage. And, how, and so in, in Norway, um, does the government control any of the rental housing or is it all privately owned? Uh, it's, uh, it's more or less privately owned. It's not... Uh... The government is not only own, owning uh, so much. Maybe something because they want to take care of uh, care of some people. Uh, but in Norway, um, ninety percent of all Norwegians are owning their houses where they live. Mm -hmm. So only ten percent is renting. They are renting. 
we are, we are expecting that this will um, uh, go up because it's getting more um, difference between people. So the wealthy is get, getting more wealthy and uh, the same as the rest of the world maybe. Uh, and they, we are expecting that uh, 20, 20 to 25% of all people will rent their house uh, or home during a few years. So this will be a, a good place for people to come and um, invest in uh, rental uh, rental homes. Now, also, I mean, Norway has, like most of the Western world, Norway has a demographic problem with not enough replacement people, um, replacement births. What's the average size family in Norway? And, and do most people have one, two, or three bedroom houses or apartments? And does that change? Whether or not you're in the city or in the suburbs, I think that uh, it has. I heard like in the news now that uh, it has never been more single people than uh, now. This may be a trend that people are uh, they they can be more in, independent, and a lot of people are choosing not to have kids as well. So um, people are uh, so it's everything you know. Have everything from people who choose to not have kids to people who have like two kids maybe but some people have like four or five kids too so it's uh, we have everything i don't know exactly i, I will the, maybe uh, maybe it's like 1.8 kids or something uh it's maybe the average mm -hmm. for for a family for for all families then. so uh, but the uh people when they uh, what what they do is that when they uh they like to live uh, really central when they have uh, when they're young, you know, and then they move out of the city. And uh, now with this uh, remote remote uh, opportunities to to work uh, from uh, from home, people are moving um, moving out and buying uh, family houses on the countryside. And even now, so they're building new uh, new uh, railways and um, better uh, better roads. So people uh, maybe they can live like two hours away and it's no problem. And I go to the office one one time a week or something. Mm -hmm. It's maybe the same in New York and uh, Connecticut. Talk to me about the Norway economy. Uh, basically, who are all these rich people and where are they making their money? Are they making it on tech, fish? Uh, you know, I mean, is it fishing? Is it uh, is it natural resources, wood? Um, you know what? What's the economy? What's driving the economy besides oil? Now it's um, it's an increasing amount of uh, lawyers, <laughs> and you have uh, you have tech, yes, you have tech, uh, and you have uh, more finance. Uh, you have uh, people who who sold their their company in tech or finance or uh, real estate agents are uh, of course there a lot of people who some of them are earning some good money you know <laughs> how about manufacturing or is it a good play are, are people i know that you know several of these um you know ireland wanted to be a finance capital and iceland wanted to be a finance capital everybody wants to be a finance capital everybody can't be a finance capital so um, a lot of people are now starting to look at being uh, at switching manufacturing instead of in the Far East, trying to get it done. I, I, is that a thing uh, in Norway or is labor cost too expensive? Yeah. It's not so much a manufacturing here. Uh, we are, uh, we maybe have, um, we have some brands, but they are pro the production is uh, in, in other countries, in China, in, uh, in Balticum. In different places like that so um so, how, about tour uh, how about tourism are you are you interconnected with the rest of europe and dependent on tourism to i know that you're selling islands rather remote islands and that's got to be to a tourist uh oriented market right but we uh, we uh, we are um i wouldn't say i wouldn't say there is a lot of people who is wealthy in the tourism markets it's not uh, but uh, maybe may, maybe some people are earning a good money on uh, restaurants and uh, tourism like that. But, uh, okay, you're yeah. selling that spot on the map that I'm showing now. That little red dot on the map that is far away from Oslo. That's far away from 
everything. Now I'm going to start showing the pictures. It's beautiful. So what it occurred to me is that you are dependent a bit on tourism, ecotourism, that people are, are drawn to Norway and Scandinavia for views like this. But it's yep. far away. Is it getting a lot closer with cheap airlines, Ryanair, and some of the other cheap airline, European airlines? Is it just becoming a little bit easier to get to and a little bit more accessible? Actually, it's not so far away uh, as you think because it takes like one and a half hour from Oslo with the plane up there. Um, and um, from London, it takes like two hours to Oslo. And then um, uh, it, if you put, if you sit in the car and you want to go to a countryside uh, from New York, maybe you want to use uh, like two, three hours in the car anyway. So it's not so, so far to get up there and have the opportunity to, uh, to look at this kind of uh, nature and use that. Uh, we actually have uh, some of the most beautiful beaches up there and, uh, and some surfing uh, opportunities too. So, but uh, it's, it seems to be far away, but um, of course, Norway is, uh, is, a, long, is, a, is a long country. Uh, actually from north to south in Norway, it's like uh, the same uh, distance as, as from south to Rome. It's and, like what are you, and what are you yeah. selling up there? We are selling fresh air. We're selling uh, activities, adventures, so skiing, uh, fishing. Uh, and uh, of course, a uh, lot of people just want to sit inside a, a small chalet to feel the, drink some red wine and feel the, uh, the hard nature, the wind outside. No, I, I, I meant, what are you physically selling? Are you selling condiments? Aye, 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 aye. <laughs> or, okay. or are you going to sell me a farm? Yeah, you can, I have a different uh, opportunities up there. You can, um, you can buy uh, a um, uh, plot of land where you can construct uh, 500 uh, uh, chalets, uh, like overwater bungalows, you know, like you, you same type as you have in uh, in Mal Maldives, you can construct up there, and you make can make a hotel, a resort, uh, and it, it's a it's a it's a big demand for these type of properties up there because in the summer uh, it, it's not enough uh, accommodation in the area because you uh, uh, you have like for uh, three hundred dollars. Then you get some really low standards, and then need uh, there are um, high demand for this kind of properties up there. And the same you can you can uh, you can also buy small chalets there. It's not it's like five uh, hundred uh, five hundred thousand dollars. You get a really nice um, cabin up there. And then you can look at the scenery and your and the and the midnight sun and the in the in the northern lights during the winter. So what well, that's yeah. David Reese asked a question in the chat just about is there pre is there uh, prefabricated manufactured housing on a luxury basis? So I mean, do you, can you buy a already almost sort of built house that shows up on a truck that you then build in these locations, or are there enough local craftsmen and construction company people to handle doing significant building? I think uh, the most when, when you construct this, uh, you would do it like uh, on a modular basis, mm -hmm. mostly uh, because you have a really good quality in that uh, direction too. So, um, so it's not uh, it's, uh, it, it, there are uh, construction companies up there, but uh, uh, the normal small you have some small resorts up there, uh, like a small uh, like. 10 to 15 different cabins. You can rent it uh, by the sea. And uh, these are uh, normally constructed by uh, local uh, hand demands, you know, and uh, hand demand. And, uh, but in this kind of, I think in, in, the, in the really close future, 
you will have some um, construction up there with uh, with more like an industrial uh, way. Okay. So, yeah. so this this is where we lean in and we ask you for all your secrets. So for all of us who want a second home in Europe, where are the good deals and how do you get a good deal? I mean, is Spain on sale these days? How about Greece? I mean, we've spent a good deal of time talking about the Norwegian islands, and I get that. But yeah. you know, certainly, certainly, you've got to have your ear to the ground throughout Europe. And what what do you think is the next big thing? I know my daughter suddenly got interested in Portugal this year and took a trip over there and said, "We have to go over there, Dad." So where where else? Where 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 are the hot the next big thing in Europe? We could have talk, uh, talk a lot about Portugal. Uh, I think uh, I, I, I believe um, the same as your daughter that uh, Portugal is coming because it's uh, quite affordable to buy in Portugal. Uh, so we, um, all this, uh, you know, Algarve uh, coast is uh, up and coming. Uh, we, we could have talked about that. I, I didn't do the really deep research now recently, but I, I was there this summer in uh, in Algarve and um, talked with the agents uh, down there, and uh, we believe that it's uh, this is one of the the markets that's really coming now. But still, people want to. If you think about, uh, they need some more development of the area. It's still a little bit um, underdeveloped uh, the area. Then we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about um, restaurants and uh, and activities. So we're still, uh, I think, I believe, really much uh, still in Spain, uh, south of Spain, uh, Marbella region. Um, seem to seem for me that doesn't stop at all. Uh, and we got uh, we. This is a really luxury market where and and around Malaga. Malaga is. Um, uh, Google is ma uh, making a new main office, like a tech valley in Malaga. So pe a lot of people, it's a really much uh, flights from London to, and, the, and all the big cities in Europe uh, down to Malaga. And they have like 320 uh, days a year uh, with uh, sunrise, nice sun, sun days. So, um, so Malaga region with uh, Marbella and uh, all this uh, is, uh, will still be really strong. And the same, of course, south of France is. Uh, they Wait a minute. Uh, Wait. Keep yeah. keep going on Mar Marbella and Mal Malaga. Why? Yes. I've never heard. I've never heard anybody talk about Malaga and Marbella. No. Yeah. Oh. That's uh, interesting. So do you do you fly uh, into uh, do you fly into Madrid and then take a train? No. Are you you go there? JFK. Somebody wrote there, uh, JFK um, is going direct plane from JFK to Malaga. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know, but uh, somebody wrote it on the on the screener. Um, but I know that uh, it's from London to Malaga. It's uh, like um, you get Ryanair from uh, and, uh, nothing, you know, you don't pay nothing. It's like 50, 50 pounds or 50, 50 dollars. Or less, uh, and th this is uh, this is a really growing. Uh, so Marbella has been the place for um, for people from Madrid when they want wanted to go for uh, uh, luxury retreats uh, for for many decades. Um, but uh, and this is a market where uh, where they are really feeling uh, that the. Um, the prices went up like 22%, my partner down there told me. And uh, and we have a kind of uh, developments there now that where you can invest and you will get like 15% uh, uh, guaranteed um, uh, return of investment. Wow. It doesn't sound so, uh, so high, but it's uh, like a guarantee. So you will really will know that you get them uh, your money back and your the 15 percent on the top how how would you describe the vibe is it like florida back in the good old days yeah 
you can you can you can compare uh, Marbella with Florida a little bit, like with uh, Miami. It's a okay. little bit like that. Yeah, you should go there. But you you uh, like two weeks ago you had uh, you had um, your friends in uh, in California, the the two women. Yes, they told about she was from Ronda. That was Ronda up in. You have been in Ronda. You told uh, Rota. R O T A. Yeah, yeah Rota. Uh, uh, Ronda. Ronda. I haven't been to Rumba. Rumba. <laughs> yeah, you haven't been to Rumba. <laughs> okay, but um, she, this woman was from Rumba. Yeah, so just outside, uh, doesn't matter. It's not so important. But okay. the, the, this is an area where, where it's still really good. Uh, so everybody is coming down there and uh, and uh, from Europe, from from uh, Germany, from UK, from there is a uh, lot of people from, and there is uh, people from Ukraine and Russia living together and no problems, you know? <laughs> That's a good thing. It's not a war between uh, the people, it's a war between the crazy leaders. So how, how are um, real estate transactions financed in different parts of Europe? So in the United States, it's traditional to get a some sort of a 30-year mortgage, and the interest rate may float or it may be fixed. And so we use a lot of leverage, you know, anywhere from 80 to 95 percent leverage. What's available in different parts of Europe for financing? You need to put on this on this project that I'm that I talked about now. Um, uh, you you put like. Uh, so you put the fifty percent, fifty percent equity, and then you get the rest uh, from the bank. Wow. But and normally, uh, more normally, you can get better. depends on the, your uh, your income, of course, and what your opportunities you paid. So um, in Norway, it's, uh, you get uh, eighty five percent uh, mortgage when you do it on your private uh, on your private income. For the companies, it's maybe less. Uh, Sure. And what, what sort of percentage, what sort of interest rate are mortgages these days? And now it's like uh, for private, uh, like 4% for private and like 6% for, uh, for the uh, commercial uh, real estate uh, developers. Cool. The different, of course, it depends on somebody get a better price, better price too. But, uh, and of course, they are. Uh, it's more difficult to get this uh, mortgage now for everybody than before. But, um, but they, there are a lot of things happening in the market. It's, uh, it's a, this times it gives a lot of opportunities too. So we can get the, the we can get the, the, the plot of land much lower, better price, and you, you, you find other uh, directions. Sure. So what about you? Are you? What are you doing the most of the time now? John, you can probably answer that better. For interest rates and what, what mortgages do people ask for these days? Well, so the, the shift, so the, once again, it's two markets. Uh, you know, there's the, there's the super luxury market. And for them, they're trying, if they're taking out a mortgage, it's because they're trying to preserve, uh, conserve cash. And, um, and take advantage of opportunities uh, during and imbalances during uh, a, a po the possible recession, um, taking advantage, you know, on the stock market and bond opportunities. So they're trying to conserve cash, but there's plenty of financing available. Banks are not tightening up. In fact, banks are scrambling right now to try and write mortgages because the the volume of deals has gone down by 50% or more since the uh since in the last couple of years there's uh there's just not that much inventory on the market and this is a national problem not just a northeast problem but they don't have enough inventory in Connecticut LA they don't have, uh San Diego all of these markets have complained about too little inventory and the mean, and that means that the banks have far fewer uh transactions to finance they're getting creative and they're offering people uh, adjustable rate mortgages uh, and telling them that if you don't like your 6% or your five, even 5.5% five mortgage now, then uh, just expect to refinance it 
in the next few years when the rates come down. So that's that's sort of the mood right now. A lot of people are are whether you're a first time home buyer buying your first house, um, picking up a adjustable rate mortgage, or because you're trying an investor trying to conserve cash. Scott, you have a you you build in the luxury market. When I say, "Are you worried?" you say to me, "No, I've got a pipeline several years in advance. I've got several years of pipeline of work in front of me." So a lot of the the very wealthy, after the liquidity we've experienced in the market and the run up in the stock market for the last several years, there's a lot of liquidity, and those projects uh, are not being canceled, are they, Scott? They're moving forward. The mood is still good. At the high end of the market, the mood is still very good. The further down you go, the more dicey it becomes. And you know, because of high construction prices and higher interest rates, the lower end is, is definitely having trouble. Because if you have to borrow money and you have to, you know, you're paying more for the money and you're paying more for what you're getting, um, that, that definitely puts a strain on. So we're hearing at the lower end, things are, are more complicated and, and tougher. But the higher end again seems to still be very vibrant. Seems like it's the same uh, over there, uh, like uh, most of the Europe as well. So um, that's a, that's an okay thing, but it's uh, it's uh, sad that the, the 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 normal people are suffering. So, um, but very soon we we are uh, everybody back again. I think we feel yeah we there. The government here is saying that uh, this is not uh, something they think is a recession, the, especially in Norway. Maybe maybe it's worse in uh, in in UK, in uh, Spain, and Portugal, for instance, for normal people. Yeah. So talk to us about um, realtors, real estate professionals, the importance of brands. It occurs to me that in America, we have experienced consolidation among uh, a lot of the top real estate agencies, several of them, I won't name names, but, but four or five of the big agencies have gone acquiring regional players. So if you're a big New York agency, three or four of the big New York agencies have now expanded to Florida and f expanded to California and now expanded to Aspen and have basically picked off some of the luxury markets across the country. Are you seeing the same kind of consolidation in the real in the luxury real estate space in Europe that we're seeing in America? I mean, specifically, Compass has made a big splash in the last couple of years. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway is aggressively, you know, expanding. Douglas Elliman expanding. So you're seeing a lot of the New York-based brands like Douglas Elliman expanding into um, what I would call regional markets like Denver and Aspen and Texas, and Dallas. Ooh. So are you seeing the same kind of thing going on in Europe or do I have to uh, work with a Norwegian company and when I go to Spain, I have to work with a Spanish company? You see the same, uh, you see the same in Europe. Uh, but it's more regional. So if in Norway you have really here is he used to be uh, in Norway it used to be like small uh, shops on every corner. We're talking about twenty five to thirty years ago, and later the banks took banks took over. So it's the banks that that's owning the real estate uh, uh, groups now. So they have the Norwegian bank. They have the big, uh, it's the biggest. They have, uh, they're selling like, doesn't sound so much for you, but it's like 25,000 houses a year. The same is the another bank. And the, the big brands here in Norway, it's, like, it's not big compared to US, but uh, so it's a consolidation and it's franchise. It's, it's difficult to get, uh, you know, I, I had the Christie's, uh, I was the affiliate of Christie's for Norway. And uh, it was, uh, I don't think talk so much about that, but it was, uh, was, for me, it was a success because I got the most uh, beautiful houses uh, for sale, but the market didn't understand it uh, that much. 
Uh, but it's the same all over Europe too. There, so it's the big, uh, it's, it's consolidation all over. And uh, but there are some countries that uh, are a little bit behind um, uh, on the on this field. Um, but we we, you know, you have in, in Europe, you have um, you have the same um, same brands uh, uh, like um, this uh, Engels and Furkers are big in Europe and you have uh, you have um, uh, in 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 uh, they, they are uh, some of them are uh, some of uh, the the agents are um, organized in for instance Christie's or Sotheby's on the high end but on the low end it's more like a lot of uh, different brands but you do, you don't know it but it's on the local uh, are, arena it's uh, they are strong so, so what I hear you saying is that it's still very uh, country by country for the lower end of the market, and that a few brands, European brands, have emerged, like Engel and Volker, for the very yeah. high-end properties, and they work across Europe. But most okay. of the business is regional and controlled country by country. Is that true? More, yeah, more country by country. So if you... If you want to buy something in South of Europe, for instance, in uh, in Kota Sur, in uh, in Cannes, then you you need to contact the agents that you go maybe into a website and then you see okay, is somebody here talking my language, and then then you contact them. So um, and you have Mike Frank, you know. Uh, are they are, are they one of the major European brands? Because I think of them as mostly. London. It's London. It's uh, but you have in uh, Cam, you have in uh, Marbella, as I told you before, and you have, uh, but you have as well uh, Christie's in uh, Stockholm. You have in Germany. You have in Switzerland. So they are still uh, up and running. I don't know if Christie's in in, in uh, so much in uh, in UK now because the Stratton Parker went out for. Uh, uh, they were acquired by uh, BNP uh, Paribas. So, um, but it's uh, it's always changing in this market. You know, <laughs> you know it yourself. It's like uh, somebody's strong in this region, and then uh, it's a little bit changing all the time. So, uh, wait, yeah. you're saying that the French bank bought Strutt and Parker, and that. That is something that you've all you, is also going on in Norway. Is that going on all over Europe or just a Norway phenomenon that banks own real estate brokerages? I think that is normal, more normal in Norway than other countries. Yeah. Uh, but you see that uh, BNP uh, Paribas acquired. Uh, um, I think they acquired them. It's they have a co-branding there, so I think it's. It can be only uh, like a corporation too, but this looks like it's uh, something uh, they acquired. Because and then and I don't see the Christie's brand anymore on that on, on their uh, logo. So we're we're, we're almost at the uh, top of the hour. What do you want to tell us here in America? You want, I mean, what do you want to tell us? Do you, you've got a lot of realtors. You got some builders. You got some architects. I see Pete down there in the corner of my screen. Pete's a phenomenal architect. Scott's a phenomenal builder. What does Norway need? You want to? You want? Of course, you want buyers. What yeah. kind of buyers? We, um, I told you just before that it's uh, it's going to go up from uh, ten to twenty five percent uh, or properties. Uh, uh, for renting out to people who want living in a, in their own in their house, so I, th I think that uh, it will be an increase of uh, rental apartments. So, so it could be good for investors to come here and uh, invest in um, in apartments construction, and the same in uh, commercial real estate, uh, and the, uh, as well for. Um, and what, what what I wanted to say is that we, we should uh, we should dig into the rest of the market together a little bit later. So I think we should have another talk soon again because then we can bring in some of our partners and talk more deeply with them uh, about different markets. 
Yep, I would like that. We're going to definitely go do some more shows in Europe. Does anybody in the audience have one final question or one one uh, one interesting story? Um, if not, I'd like to thank you uh, for a really great and illuminating, you know, look. I mean, we at, at Europe. I mean, I know we spent a good deal of time on Norway, but I think that you were able to successfully uh, paint a picture. Uh, over how Europe is dealing with the uh, potential recession. Uh, you're saying uh, what recession? Uh, you're talking about oil wealth in Norway. And so not all of the countries are affected by the energy crisis in the same way or the war in the same way. You say that the mood is good and the building is good uh, in Norway and throughout Europe. Um, so I think this is very encouraging. And I think you ended by saying, send the investors that you've got yeah. some good investments for them, as well as some destination properties. Did I get that right? That's right. And then I send some investors back to you as well, of course. And uh, we'll be, and I thank you as well, because it was a really nice uh, conversation we had. And uh, I adore you for this uh, really good podcast. Uh, and I'm listening to you um, every time. You are a star for me, you know, uh, since uh, we met the first time. It was in Scottsdale, Arizona. The first you time. are no, the it, star it, for me because I think that you take it for granted that everybody trots around the globe like you do, making personal connections with realtors. I, I mean, I only left my house twice in the last 10 years to, and went to two conferences, and you were at both of them. And I think to myself, man, this guy works hard, and he knows <laughs> everybody and he knows the folks in scottsdale and he knows the people in spain and so i am so honored to have you on the show and i think this is really great and i think everybody on this show would profit from writing to you and connecting with you if they have any interest in europe whatsoever so thank you my friend Ivan. thank you it's been great and it's been far too long and i'll see you again maybe in a month or so we'll do it again very good. I see you. And I'm coming to visit you in the uh, new canon. Anytime you want. See you. We've got room. Okay. Good ciao. afternoon. Good. Uh, ciao, ciao, ciao. And everybody else, we're going to do, uh, we're going to be back in New York and we're going to be talking to three of the top New York interior designers next week. We're going to talk about their ideas to transform a house or an apartment with fabric and textiles. So that's what we've got going on the show next week. And hopefully I'll get Roberto back. He's traveling to Canada today, so couldn't be with us. But we miss you, Roberto. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. Ciao. Ciao.